So anyway, that's what the rest of the book does. I'm just going to give you a couple very quick examples in welfare and the environment. Basically, um, I talked about how forced charity is an, oxy an oxymoron. The way the system was before, uh, before the federal government got involved, it was about one person helping another. And in that relationship, that the person receiving the help gains, but also the person giving the help gains. It's a gain for both people. That's been eliminated from the system. Now they just confiscate our money, send 72% of it. This is from, uh, this, this book is great because uh, in A Call for Revolution, Martin Gross, what he does is he uses the government's own numbers. These are all government's numbers. And this is a conservative estimate. 72% of the money that we send to Washington, D.C. to help people and all the social welfare agencies stays in Washington, D.C. in the bureaucracy. 28% goes through, through the recipients. Can you think of a good way that we could save 72% of our money? It's going to just hire a bookkeeping company and send the checks. We'd be 72% better off. But we can do much better than that. And uh, in this book, Renewing American Compassion, Barbara Nolasky does a really great job of showing how well the bottom-up structure works, helping people and solving the, all these problems, drug abuse and welfare, and handicapped, and all these different things in a bottom-up much, much better than what we have now. By the way, bottom-up organizations, freedom-based organizations, nonprofit organizations, like Habitat for Humanity, for example, typically 15 to 20 percent of the money that's raised that goes to Habitat for Humanity goes to cost of raising money and administration. 80% goes directly to build houses for people who need houses. Same way with all the no other nonprofit organizations. So which, where would you think would be the best use of our money? To give it to a nonprofit organization where 80% of the money goes to help the people, or to the federal government where 80% stays with the federal bureaucracy? That's pretty simple, it's just economics. The environment, I got involved with some environmental uh, companies that I funded. And so I've been to Sierra Club meetings and things like that. Very fascinating psychology. They, they raise hundreds of millions of dollars. Greenpeace, Sierra Club. You know where that money goes? Lobby. It goes to lawyers to lobby the federal government. It ends up going to the federal government. Uh, politicians support different politicians who support their causes. Very, very little that goes directly to entities that are helping. It's a waste. Terrible, terrible waste. And the interesting thing is, as Robert Kennedy said, government is the biggest polluter. The federal government is the biggest polluter in our country. Yeah, and guess what? When they kill people, let's say that they pollute a lake, something that they're building pollutes a lake, and people die. There's absolutely nothing they can do. There's no suit. There's no reparations. There's no nothing. They have no liability. It's called sovereign immunity. And not only does that go for government officials, it goes for any independent contractor company working for the government. Sovereign immunity extends to them. So there's no, you have no, no way of, of recovering any damage. So trusting the government is like the fox guarding the hen house. How, however, the real environmental solutions, ladies and gentlemen, are restoring our republic and our common law justice system, common law grand juries. Because if somebody, you now you have the right to do anything you want on your property, but if you destroy the rights of your neighbors, your wa their water or their air quality, you have to repair those damages. Restitution. You know how quickly we'd re repair environmental damage in this country if we went back to this system? And anybody, any entity, government, corporate, or individual that destroyed the air and water of someone else would have to compensate them? It would be, it would be an amazing quick change in the environmental quality of our whole country. Okay, let's talk about the solution. So basically what we're saying, folks, in the Republic of the United States is that we're going to go back to where this country was in 1791 when the Republic was formed. Because everything that's been done since then has damaged what they put in place at that time. And it doesn't really exist anymore. So what we're going to do is we're going to educate and we're going to give you an opportunity to sign in the Republic if you would like by declaring what's called your sovereign rights for indigenous power. By the way, when I wrote to th this book about indigenous power, I, you know, I hadn't heard that term used very much. And then when I was looking at the Republic and I saw this declaration, I said, this is going to be the right group for me. Uh. Sign up for your local, grand, local county grand juries because that's the key uh, to taking back our rights uh, on the local level. Now some of this stuff is, uh, is going to be, many of you may have not have heard before. It's, it's some pretty uh, intense stuff. But uh, how many of you have seen this movie? Okay. What is it? This is The Matrix. 
And in this movie, Neo, this is Neo, Neo has a pretty good insight that something's wrong, but he doesn't know the whole story. So some people who know the whole story get a hold of him. The guy's name is Morpheus, that's Samuel L. Jackson. And Samuel L. Jackson tells uh, Morphe or Neo that he has a choice. He can take the red pill and hear the whole truth, or he can take the blue pill and go back to blissful ignorance, forget everything he already knows. And of course, he takes the red pill, and it's kind of a shock to his nervous system. The movie is great if you haven't seen it. But essentially, ladies and gentlemen, because we were bottom up for so long, this country has a lot, still has a lot of prosperity to it, and has until recently, probably not going to have much longer. But right now, we're still the wealthiest slaves in the world, but we still are slaves. So essentially, what we're saying is that in 1871, a, corporate, a corporation was formed called the United States Corporation, and it was, it was incorporated in Delaware, and it controls only the District of Columbia and its territories. That's called the United States Corporation. That is the entity which has been acting as our government for some time now. Now, the first time that we heard about this, or that we could find anything in official documents to back this theory up, was this Supreme Court case. This is very interesting. This was in 1901. A care, a, the case was called Downs versus Bidwell. Marshall Harlan was a Supreme Court justice. And here's what he said in that case. The idea prevails with some. Indeed, it found expression in arguments at the bar. In other words, in the legal community, in the government, in the courts, the judges and the lawyers are talking about this concept that there are two governments operating. That we have in this country substantially or practically two national governments. One to be maintained under the Constitution with all its restrictions, and the other to be maintained by Congress outside and independently of that. It's pretty incredible, huh? He goes on to say that by exercising such powers as, as others of the nation or of Earth are accustomed to. In other words, this operating outside of the Constitution with all its requirements is just like all the other nations on Earth. This is very interesting because he's pointing out a true fact here that the United States of America is the only country in the world that has founding documents that recognize, that are based on indigenous power, that are based on fundamental principles of divine law, or laws of nature, whatever you want to call it, but laws that are unchangeable. We're the only one. That's why those who want power throughout the world must destroy the United States, because of this. So, and he also says in that event, if we ever do op start operating on, in an a, a, a form of government that's outside of the Constitution. We will pass from an era of constitutional liberty guarded and protected by a written Constitution into an era of legislative absolutism. And that's exactly what we have. What we are operating under now is corporate <coughs> law or statutory law or admiralty law. You can call it pretty, all pretty much the same thing. It's ruler's law, which means that whoever is ruling at that moment makes the law. Very, very different than common law. So here's how the Constitution was usurped. We're going to go through some dates and some significant things that happened. Way back in 1788, the United States was officially bankrupt. 1790, U.S. statutes at large abolished the states of the Republic and created federal districts. This is the first step to creating sta uh, corporate states and the first step towards creating corporate individuals. 1845, don't forget it. Uh, Congress passed legislation that would ultimately allow common law to be usurped by admiralty law. Uh, this is where the, uh, the, the flags with the, uh, we have one in here? Gold fringe. The gold fringe came in. So this was the first step towards that. Now it didn't happen then, but it gradually happened over time. But it started way back then. 1860 was the critical year. 1860, there was no quorum in the Senate or the House of Representatives because the southern states had vacated Congress. There was no quorum. They could not officially hold business. So Lincoln basically declared martial law, in fact. He, he declared a War Powers Act, national emergency, which gave him unprecedented powers and removed it from the other branches. And that act is still in effect. And there are six other presidents, five other presidents, including Roosevelt, that passed War Powers Act similar to this, and all of them are still active. They were never sunsetted. They were never canceled. In 1863, the Libra Code was established, taking away your property and rights. This is the first step where they, they collateralized our public lands in 1863 to the bankers. 1864 to 1867, several Reconstruction Acts were passed, forcing the states to ratify the 14th Amendment, which made everyone slaves. Uh, we were reading the 14th Amendment today, 
it showed me even more. I learned even more about how it enslaved us. But uh, the main thing to understand is where it talks about privileges. This is completely different than indigenous versus surrogate power. This is, and everything up till that point was all about natural rights. But 14th Amendment is where they brought in the term privileges. A privilege is something that can be revoked. Completely different than a natural right, or, uh, you know, that's based in uh, inherent in divine law. So basically, the 14th Amendment did not free the slaves. It enslaved everyone. 1871, the United States became a corporation with a new constitution and a new corporate government. <clears throat> 1917, the Trading with the Enemy Act was passed. Why was it passed? Because we were at war and the government wanted money. So it passed this act. So anybody that with, with German descent or any ties at all to any of the powers that we were fighting, they could confiscate, that they could classify them as enemy combatants and confiscate, legally confiscate all their property. But in 1933, when they confiscated the gold, the only way that they could confiscate the gold was to reclassify the rest of us as enemy combatants under this act. And that's exactly what they did, and that continues to today. We are actually classified as enemy combatants. Also in 1933, there was a second bankruptcy, and that's where they started to use our private lands as collateral. That's why you pay property taxes today. You do not own your land, you're a tenant on your land. If you think you own your land, try this experiment. <laughs> Don't pay your property taxes for six months and see what happens. 1944, Washington, D.C. was deeded to the International Monetary Fund by the Bretton Woods Agreement. Roosevelt, there might be a Democrat, basically he, he gave away our, uh, to, the international, to the International Bank. Yep, they all did. Congress, the IRS, and the President work for the IMF. The IRS is not a U.S. government agency. It is an agency of the IMF. Our elected officials are supposed to operate under the limits of the oath of office to uphold the U.S and state constitutions, but of course they don't because they're not working for the republic under the constitution, they're working for a corporation that is owned by the IMF. That starts to explain things, doesn't it? A little bit about why they do the things they do, why they don't honor or follow the constitution. Our founding fathers looked back to history for precedent. What they found was the Magna Carta, the Great Charter of Freedom, set a precedent to change England forever. Folks, this was all based on divine law. And like I said, natural law. And it's much, much different. Statutory or ruler's law is different than common law. Common law is natural law or God's law. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go into that. I don't have any time. But I'm going to give you a book that does a great job. My, so funny, my son calls me last night. And he says, Dad, I'm reading this great book. It's called Whatever Happened to Justice by Richard Mayberry. You've got to read it. I said, well, I, read it. I just read it for the third time. And I've told about 2,000 people in the last three weeks to read it. But it, this, is, this is a book. But anyway, that, isn't that good? For, yeah. Yeah. Whatever Happened to Justice by Richard Mayberry. And the website is right up there, uh, bluestockingpress.com. There's two books you're going to want to get. Eventually, I guarantee you, if you read these two, you're going to uh, uh, buy his whole series of 11 books because they're phenomenal. But uh, Whatever Happened to Justice, explains law, explains how important law is to the economy. Uh, you don't have a free enterprise economy unless you have the right justice system and the right laws. So this is foundational for understanding law, justice, and government. This, whatever happened to Penny Candy, is foundational for understanding economics. They go hand in hand. And this, will, this could save everything that you own when, if this, if, during these times if you understand principles of economics. This will explain the principles of government. So highly recommend those two books. What's the author's name again? Richard Mayberry. Thank you. And uh, what uh, Richard Mayberry, so there's the website. Uh, essentially, what the common law does is it 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 is based on two fundamental principles. Essentially, ladies and gentlemen, we could have two laws. Do all that you have agreed to do. In other words, honor your agreements, honor your contracts. If you agree to do something, you have to follow through. Keep your word. Keep your word, right. Do not encroach on other persons or their property. Do not encroach on other persons. In other words, don't bother other people, physically or in any way. And don't encroach on other people's property. If everybody followed those laws, we would not need government.